Um, it features a candidate, at least for my, my history comes from a grandfather serving this when I was growing up. Um, and when, usually when we talk about food and what kind of taste preference people have, there's a, there's a huge part of it that is memory. And um, I don't know, it, there, was, there was someone here who hadn't had this candy before at all. It's someone who's never tasted this. Yeah. Can you describe for me what it tastes like? Too much butter. Too much butter. <laughs> yeah. Has anyone else who had never had it before? Hmm? Anyone else who can describe for me what it tastes like? Sugar. Sugar? Coffee? Coffee? Cream? Cream. No, I agree with him. Butter. Butter. From yeah. memory. Um, the thing is, like, for me it would be almost impossible, I think, to, like, I can look at the back of the bag and see what it contains, and then I'll probably be able to, based on that, tell you what it tastes like, um, <laughs> of some kind of interpretation of ingredients, and I'm pretty sure it contains both butter and, uh, and sugar and uh, cream, well, butter, cream, um, and potentially, I don't know if it contains coffee, um, but the point is just here that it's almost impossible to separate taste from memories. So it's almost impossible if you had this candy as a childhood to then deconnect that taste. And if you would ever sort of, the, you know, it's like uh, Danish people bringing licorice everywhere, uh, trying to explain other people why this is such a fantastic thing, it's like extreme <laughs> taste. Um, and, and these things go like through almost everything we eat. Um, yeah. And that of course means that taste is very much defined in, in this history of families and where we grew up and uh, what we ate when we grew up and so on. And that also means and some of what we work with in Bite Me is a lot what we do is um, help sort of food producers, culinary producers, drinks producers, who are making new things in how they can actually develop that together with people through experiences and actually also um, communicate to people how the food is actually supposed to be felt. Because there's a, a big difference between, you know, making a food product and then putting it on a supermarket shelf and thinking, I have, you know, Okay, I'm a cheese farmer somewhere in, in Jutland, and I've made a fantastic cheese, and I've worked on it for 30 years, and I'm absolutely sure that I've made the perfect cheese. The only problem is that that in how we build our sort of food society, food systems today, there's absolutely no way for this food, uh, for me as a cheese producer, to ever communicate to the person who is buying cheese, bringing it home, and serving at the table what is this cheese actually supposed to taste like? And if you would bring these two completely disconnected people together, they would most likely have a very sort of difficult, they would probably des describe two different cheeses to, to some extent. Of course, they might, if you put cumin, uh, like cumin in it, they will both be able to identify that. But there's not the same sort of emotional <coughs> connection to the product. So what we do a lot is sort of try to show, show and have people experience food in order for them to understand it and know how it sort of how it's supposed to feel, how it's supposed to look like, how it's supposed to uh, be used, or how it could be used, and how what you can do with it, and how it can be sort of integrated into into your life. In um, so it's sort of a education process, um, and it's also a lot of what people a lot of the time when we sort of go around and we meet people who work with food, um, and it's basically they work with high quality products that are more expensive than uh, uh, sort of mass produced stuff. They usually say that, um, okay, and an example is, and I would have loved to bring them, uh, I have brought some of their product, I would have if it wasn't because uh, I met them a few weeks ago. Um, I would have brought their product if it wasn't because I only had hand loggers and thus couldn't bring this uh, liquid uh, on the flight back. Uh, but I met them in Germany, and they were like, it, it's a Finnish company that produces um, super uh, high-quality 
wild blueberry syrups and drinks. Mm -hmm. It's uh, and sort of they tell a story about how much they've spent developing this product, and then going, the only place we can sell this is Japan. Mm -hmm. So they they this sort of wild harvested, uh, well not organic because it's not a production, so it's not certified organic, but nevertheless, is then shipped to Japan because that's the only place they can sell it. Um, and the reason they describe it is because, well, in Japan for some reason they have a connection to these wild blueberries and this taste and this world, um, and also a sort of less price sensitive idea of how much food and drinks can cost. Um, while in Europe they go, well, we, we basically first have to be able to sort of train tons of people in what this product actually is. We have to first like spend, you know, wait 20 years until people can remember having, you know, have an emotional connection to the product they've made. So it's basically a very sort of long, slow process to integrate food into people's <laughs> everyday life. Uh, and especially if you make something that is very far away from uh, something we know already. Mm -hmm. Does that make sort of sense? Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what we, we just try to read, sort of put these two worlds closer together by making a lot of experiences and see how people interact with, with products. Sometimes we also do it for uh, producers of the products to, uh, to make them uh, sort of see what their products become in the hands of consumers. Yeah. Come on, cheer again, happy days are here again. All together, shout it now, there's no one who can doubt it now. So let's tell the world about it now, happy days are here again. Your cares and troubles are gone, there'll be no more from now on. Happy days are here again, the skies above are clear again. Let us sing the song of cheer again. Happy days are here again. So you've uh, you've uh, been served a, a small uh, glass of uh, coconut water. Coconut water. Um, and of course, it's supposed to come out of the coconut. And of course, you're supposed to have uh, sand between your feet and uh, uh, like you know, shells and uh, <laughs> the sound of water. And uh, the best I can come up with was instead to give you a little, uh, you know. Cozy Beach video from uh, the 1940s. Um, I don't know. Is, is there anyone who hasn't had coconut water before? Yeah. Hmm? Can you describe what it, what what does coconut water taste like? Not at all like coconut ice cream. No. And even not like coconut oil. Hmm? Yeah. Is there anyone else who has any kind of? Uh, I, I, you know, I have absolutely no idea how to describe the taste of coconut water besides that it tastes like coconut water. <laughs> I, I, I would have absolutely no words for it. Uh, it is a little bit sour. Mm -hmm. It's not that very sweet. Very slight. It's not that fresh. I think when when I uh, smelled it, it smells a little bit like Danish rye bread. So I was not sure if it was coconut water. <laughs> or rye bread. <laughs> rye bread water. <laughs> Smells a bit like elderflower. Yeah. It has a very distinctive smell. That's the sort of and I I think actually there's a there's a cute interesting part about coconut water which is becoming this super more and more this high shot uh, fantastic uh, natural product that is sold everywhere at high prices on supermarket shelves. Um, is that it has this when it comes out of a, 
a package. It has this very distinct smell, which I don't, I have no memory of it having if you're sitting on a, a beach and <laughs> drinking it the way you're, pro you're supposed to. Then it just sort of. What, what's yeah. the connection with the, the beach? No. So, um, this is. Um, Okay, I'll get to that. Um, the connection to the beach. Yes, this is a. Uh, this brings me to another point about these uh, about food and uh, and things. Um, have any of you ever travelled, uh, gone on holiday somewhere South <laughs> Europe? <laughs> You've probably all gone on holiday. Uh, tasted something great and then <coughs> brought home whatever you uh, tasted. Yeah. Yeah. Did it taste the exact same when you got it home as when you had it down? Yeah. So that's a um, there's a lot of sort of in in all who's in at all who's university they've done they've done more and more work into this, discussing that from different scientific <coughs> angles there's actually a point that when they use the example of when you go to uh, Greece and you buy a bottle of Garcina that you had at the local uh, restaurant by the beach, and you buy it and you take it home, and then you open it and uh, go, that did not taste at all anywhere near, it. well, basically they say, it tastes, it tastes like shit now, and it tastes really great when I'm <laughs> sitting on a Greek island. Um, so, and there's basically, that's where the beach comes in, coconut water for me, tastes not very good when I'm drinking it from a shot glass out of a package and uh, where I just bought it from in a sort of cardboard uh, bottle in the, from a shelf in Superbosen. Hmm. Um, very, very far away from what it tastes like when sitting on a beach, um, which is where I've had it. I've, I've never actually sort of drank it otherwise. Um, so that's the basic connection. That there is this, and, and you can look at it as even sort of in neurogastronomy and sort of in many different aspects, there's that there's actually sort of scientific, whatever you call scientific, evidence that it is different. It tastes different. It's not just an idea we have, but your brain actually makes it a different taste picture of uh, Hatsina on a Greek, Greek beach and Hatsina when you're sitting uh, at home in the kitchen. <coughs> it's two, two different tastes of food, and of course the same happens when we produce food, uh, in many ways, like, it's, there's people, depending on where you eat it, it's gonna be different tastes, and that's not the same food in some way. It's like, it's easy to do with a few examples, it's very difficult to do with uh, other things, like, we start discussing, uh, does uh, rye bread taste the same? Uh, if you eat it, the same rye bread at a lunch canteen compared to uh, if you were eating it uh, in the summer house on a sunny day um, with your family. Is it gonna be, even though it's the exact same rye bread, is it gonna taste exactly the same? Yeah. And that's the argument that it does. And that, of course, makes it super difficult to actually discuss what things taste like and actually even make food that's supposed to taste it a certain way. Hmm? We have uh, more food. <laughs> the next one is a classic. Uh, I have stolen, I don't know, has anyone ever been to the restaurant Alchemist in Copenhagen? Okay, good, because uh, then, uh, well, I, I've, stolen it. I've stolen the next thing from them. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I'll let them know one day. Uh, <laughs> but uh, maybe uh, this one actually, uh, I think already she went out and to pick it up. Know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me just wait a moment, <coughs> and then uh, I'll ask you uh, instead, how many of you uh, have grown up watching Beverly Hills? <laughs> oh, not so many. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Anastasia, you can uh, you can bring it in. Yeah. Hmm? 
Uh, yeah, we can play the video. Activity. 
that, that uh, I don't know. I, I usually don't serve frozen pizza for people who come for dinner. <coughs> This is, uh, this is um, like um, most cases, that, that's at least what we say, and also what my, much of my, uh, my piece was about is that most ideas of taste is basically defined in conversations with people. So when we talk about what does coconut water taste like, that's when we actually define what does coconut taste water taste like. like. That's when we sort of come up with a Vocabulary, and now I'll probably never again be able to uh, to drink it without thinking that it smells like rye uh, rye bread, because I, will, you know, it, it sort of it imprints on your on your memory and on your idea of what taste is. Um, so in most cases, these conversations at a um, when I did my field work with families, it was the conversation at a dinner table that defined where they if they talk about what food tastes like. Those are actually the moments where a family will agree what taste is. Uh, so a lot of my uh, sort of pieces was a lot about the very slight differences in the same dishes <coughs> when you compare them from family to family, but the very important differences <coughs> that it would be ever so tiny that I would not have any idea that they were different. But if you would serve them for different families, they would be very, very well aware that these, uh, this spaghetti bolognese was not like the spaghetti bolognese that they usually have. Even though from the outside, as an outside person, it really was like, like really had to have it explained to be able to recognize it in the face. But they would be able to identify it super plain, instantly. Um, so that's sort of, and the funny thing about the toast, and the frozen pizza is that that's something you've defined for yourself. Like, that's a relationship to a TV show. Yeah. Hmm? Does it make sense? Hmm? Just, uh, okay, then we have one more thing. Maybe Anastasia? The next one you didn't have to actually eat together. I promise you I won't make it as bad as the video shows. You don't have to do that. It's not.
and then if you want to, you can uh, get the same. <coughs> Look in your eye. <laughs> Now we're just going to talk. It was difficult, difficult to find. Uh, Disney is very uh, protective of their copyrights. So. <laughs> And I was uh, this is actually the last the last uh, bite of food before in this workshop. Um, and uh, we, we do need to eat. I, I, I think I'll skip bread and olive oil. Um, there's a um, is there anyone, if I, like this time I, I promise you I haven't tried to uh, sort of hide anything, I haven't, it's not a, you know, I, it's not whatever the frozen pizza equivalent of bread and olive oil and salt would be. Uh, bread coming straight out from the oven and olive oil and salt, like, yeah, hopefully, okay for reasons, for reasons of all of it. Yeah, um, yeah. so it's hard to stick in yeah. if you don't break it. There's, um, the idea of olive oil yeah. and bread and sort of salt that you have and then in, uh, you put it back. in restaurants yeah, it back. is, uh, is, is a very sort of peculiar, strange tradition because I don't like maybe there is. Is there ever any of you who at home when you had guests coming for dinner that actually put bread and olive oil and salt on the table? <laughs> it's good. Awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very strange that no one like if, if you go to a restaurant you or like if you need to go to sort of a classical restaurant, it, it's almost become something we expect to happen, and also something that people usually quite enjoy and sort of evaluate the restaurant based on carton. Like the first experience is the first thing that a restaurant serves, uh, and so. How the bread and the olive oil and the salt is will basically be a quite high influencer of how good is this restaurant actually gonna like how good was the meal because you will remember that first bite and if they now is it is a bit difficult to serve bad bread and olive oil but if the restaurant starts out with you know <coughs> dry dry bread and bad olive oil that will sort of influence a lot the entire meal, or like your perception of the entire meal, um, which is, is quite interesting. And it's usually also because the people who are sitting around the table, and that's why I use it as an example, is that um, if you have four people going out to eat, and you, four people, already at bread and oil, decide that this is a sort of, this tastes bad whatever taste bad means, then uh, that will basically, that will influence how you also evaluate every other dish. Because you'll start, you'll talk about food in the same way. Like you'll, you'll sort of, you go like, oh, this is not very good. And then <coughs> you sort of, you, the, the conversation there is what basically de defines how good or bad the food tasted. Um, that's the four people eating together that defines that. Because there's no, you know, it's not a, a yes or no uh, sort of formula, mathematical formula, uh, the idea of taste. So it's, you know, I think a lot of restaurant chefs, at least also some of the ones we work with, will recognize the idea of actually sending out food, uh, serving food for people, and then getting it come back because the person being served it doesn't like it. And then usually chefs, they taste it themselves to go, is there something wrong with what I've served? And in some instances, of course, something might have gone wrong. But also in some instances, they'll taste it and go, 
well, that tastes exactly like how it's supposed to taste. But something at that exact, and it might never have been sent back by anyone else that entire night. So something at that exact table makes their perception of what it tastes like be completely different from all the other tables. That can, of course, also be that one person who just doesn't like that there's coriander in the dish. Uh, but then usually they wouldn't know it. But, you know, there was hidden coriander. Um, or something like that. But it's sort of, um, but it can also be just because at that table there's something else going on uh, in the conversation about what the food tastes like. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was my final word. <laughs> I'll you. end on that though. Thank you. Yeah? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.